The Ancestral Trail, Book 6, Cossards and Killer Bees, first published by Marshall Cavendish, 1993, based on a story by Frank Graves. How the trio managed to survive the perilous descent down the hillside, Richard never knew. Their palms bore rope burns, their feet ached from walking on sharp rocks, and their bodies were bruised from frequent tumbles. At last, the hills grew lower. A few straggly trees rose to greet them, and before long they were in the forest's upper reaches. Orcan was the first to pick up traces of the book's passage. He pointed out broken branches and fresh clods of earth that showed where Melek's burden had smashed its way through the trees. Then he saw a stunted, wide-topped cedar. Look, over there, he said as they peered across the treetops. They saw a familiar leather-bound shape resting precariously in the spreading boughs of the cedar. The three quickly made their way to the ground and found the tree. Orcan scrambled up the trunk, pulled himself level with the book and reached out to rescue it. I've got it, he shouted triumphantly. And seconds later, Orcan was back on the ground, dusting loose bark from his clothes. We'd better check the prophecy before we move on, Richard said, as Melek and Orcan checked the straps that had held the book. Melek read aloud from the rustling pages as Richard and Orcan listened. <coughs> Marching, flying, death at hand, the brave must fear them both. Hark the words in ruined land of wise and ancient growth. Wings that weapons cannot quell will catch them unaware. Chosen's choice of touch will tell and lead them safe to open air. I don't like the sound of death at hand and ruined land, Richard said when Melek had finished. Still, it says we'll be safe in the end. The three companions stumbled on towards the valley bottom. A gentle rustling quivered through the trees. Then the sound took on a definite beat and they heard marching feet and brisk shouts coming towards them. Cossards, Orcan said nervously. It's for real this time. We must hide, quickly. His eyes lit up on a wide crack at the base of a dying tree. There, in that hollow trunk. They crammed into the narrow space and watched as the Cossards thundered past. The evil ones search and destroy units. They'll kill anyone they come across. They're disciplined, mindless and completely ruthless. Orcan said. The Cossards were short and squat. Heavy armour clanked on their bodies, and from every joint there projected sharp metal spikes. They were armed with axes and barbed spears. The only vulnerable point seemed to be their faces, where steel helmets opened to reveal razor-sharp teeth, squab noses and deep-set eyes. Behind the formation, an officer bellowed harsh commands. Richard let out a sigh of relief when the last Cossard stamped past their hiding place. For a while they listened as the shouts and tramp of marching feet receded into the distance. Then, when Orcan deemed it was safe, they emerged into the open forest. The going was much easier now. The trio were backtracking on the path that the Cossards had smashed through the undergrowth. Before long, however, the trees and bushes around them were either dead or dying. Once green foliage was now shriveled. Tree trunks were white as bones. This is Green Man Wood, Orcan said. And this is what the evil one has done to it. This is how we'd like the whole land to be, either dead or in his power. The trio trudged on, snapping lifeless twigs underfoot and pushing through silvery branches. When they reached the remnants of a clearing, the three stopped, resting against a huge oak that still struggled pitifully for life. Once it must have been among the tallest trees in the forest. Now it was half dead. It was a shell, doomed to extinction. As Richard rested against the tree, he felt something on his shoulder. Too exhausted to turn around, he shrugged it off. But a branch was rubbing against his back. Then Richard felt pressure on his arm. He looked round at Melek and Orcan, but overcome by tiredness, his companions had closed their eyes. Suddenly Richard felt a solid grip on his arms. Looking sideways, he could see some of the tree's roots holding him in a deathly grasp. Blind terror filled his heart. They had walked straight into one of the evil one's traps. Then Richard heard a deep, rumbling voice. 
Don't worry, the voice boomed from within the tree. I'm not going to hurt you. Richard's heart raced in panic. Was he imagining this? He looked at his companions. They had opened their eyes and were looking round for the source of the voice. The roots fell away and Richard jumped up. At first glance the tree looked just like any other. Then Richard noticed a face sketched in lines of withered bark. It was concealed among the natural bumps and creases in the wood. The craggy face looked kind and friendly. Richard remembered the prophecy. Hark the words in ruined land of wise and ancient growth. I must pass on a warning, the tree said. I am the only survivor here. The rest of my family have fallen to the evil one, and I have little time left to myself. A few days at most. I know you are the chosen one, and you must heed my advice. The voice gasped, for breath. Watch out for cozards. We've seen them already, Richard said with an air of confidence. Be on your guard always, the oak went on. There are eyes and ears everywhere now. Enemy flying squads are on the lookout for anything that moves. Grap Fritz, Orkan said. We've dealt with them before. No, no. The tree's voice sounded even weaker. Others that are dangerous with deadly stings. The companions could hardly hear a word now. Orkan shook his head and motioned for them to leave. He must be talking about Grapfritz, Orkan whispered. We'd better leave here quickly. Take care, the old oak murmured. Remember, they are quicker and deadlier than you would ever dream. The three companions thanked the dying tree for its warning and tiptoed away. Well, at least that explains the wings that weapons cannot quell, Richard said. Now we're forewarned. The three were coming out of the brittle woodland into a clearing. Whatever life had once lingered here was gone. Sharp white twigs lay scattered over brown earth. Dead trees lurched dangerously, their shallow roots barely gripping the soil. Richard became aware of a faint noise. It was a steady hum, and as he listened, the noise grew in strength. It's the Grap Fritz, Richard shouted. Run! From deep in the trees, the trio could hear a steady, lazy drone. Just then, Melek glanced back. Look, he said, pointing at the forest. Richard and Orkan looked back as they ran. Out of the trees, coming towards them, like a black hand, was a huge swarm of bees. From afar, the bees looked like a dark, smoky mass, but already the first scouts were edging nearer. Even from a distance, Richard could see that they looked more like huge hornets than bees. The bees' narrow bodies were marked with the pointed horn of the evil one's mask. Some bees were armed with gigantic stings ready for action. The drone had reached a note of shrill fury. Killer bees! That's what the tree was warning us about, Orkan cried. And even as he spoke, there loomed in front of them a high wall of branches, the corpse of a thick thorn hedge that ran off to either side without a break. Orkan took the lead, slashing at the branches with his sword and using his free hand to push the debris aside to clear a path. Finally, he chopped through the hedge and the three struggled out into the open. Ahead lay a landscape of soaring mountains, gouged with dried up riverbeds and the scars of recent landslips. Orkan led his two companions up along the course of a dried up stream, whose flat terraces formed a natural staircase. They were scrambling up a giant step when vicious bellowing echoed up the rock face. The Cossards had returned.
The three sprang like goats up the dry stream. Higher and higher they scrambled until the stream bed petered out. Richard stared ahead and saw Golan's features above a narrow gap in the rock face. He pointed out the gap to the others, and at that moment they heard the grinding of boots on rocks. A lone cozard was approaching them. Orkan turned to Richard. I'll hold him up, he said. You two get inside. As Melek and Richard scrambled into the rocky crevice, Orkan took out his sword. Then a whistling sound rent the air, and a barbed spear landed right beside them. Orkan jumped sideways, just in time, but he found himself face to face with the cozard. The stormtrooper's mouth was curled back in an awful grin as he swung his heavy axe. Watching from the gap in the rock face, Richard and Melek's eyes widened in horror. The cozard's blade glanced Orkan's cheek. He jerked his head back and lost his balance for a split second. At that moment, the cozard flung himself upon Orkan and raised his weapon. His eyes were staring wildly into Orkan's. But then, to Richard and Melek's surprise, the stormtrooper lifted a hand to his neck and stumbled. Orkan squirmed free and jumped to his feet. His sword cut through the air and struck the cozard with such force that the sword flew from Orkan's hand. The cozard plunged backwards off the rocky slope. Stopping only to pick up his sword, Orkan ran back to join his companions. He jammed his sword into his scabbard and then scrambled in through the narrow opening in the rock face. Look, Richard shouted joyfully, the bees are attacking the cozards. I know, Orkan replied, one of them got that scout in the neck. Luckily it didn't go for me too. The bees, starved of prey in the dead forest, had sensed far richer pickings from the band of newcomers than from the three small specimens they had previously targeted. It did not matter to them that the cozards were covered in armour. Their stings could penetrate even the tightest joints. The fact that the cozards were in the evil one's service did not seem to matter to the bees either. Evil has no scruples. The swarm bunched into a tight fist, raised itself slightly into the air, then fell like thunder on its new foe. Richard was amazed at the cozard's speed. The outer ranks dropped their knees and raised their shields vertically, while the innermost troops crouched, likewise, and hoisted their weapons flat above their heads. Their move was performed with total precision in one violent clash of steel, transforming what had once been a squad of soldiers into a solid metal box against which the bees burst in confusion. However, the tortoise-shaped box could not hold forever against opponents as determined as the bees. The swarm surged like water against the cozard formation, squirming its way through the weakest points. One by one, gaps appeared in the shield wall as individual cozards broke screaming into the open, ripping off their helmets and trying to crush the creatures that crawled over their faces. The cozards kept their discipline. For every shield bearer who broke and ran, another took his place, the squad forming again in an even tighter square. Amazingly, the cozards were actually advancing, leaving a thick carpet of crushed and crippled insects in their wake. The two forces were well matched. Orkan gave his friends a push. Come on, let's move now while they're busy attacking each other. The three companions plunged back into the crevice. To their surprise, the narrow opening led into a dark, domed chamber. It was easily tall enough for them to stand in. The floor was covered in sand, and the wall had been undercut at waist level by long-gone floods. In the faint light, they could just make out a dark hole set just above the waterline. Richard wondered what lay in store now. He fingered Golan's amulet, and once again he had the comforting feeling that the Guardian's presence was with him. He felt sure they should go in. Come on, we'll go down there, Richard commanded. And without hesitation, he heaved himself over the tunnel's rocky sill. After a moment's pause, Orkan and Melek followed Richard. They found themselves in a dreary passage, barely shoulder height, that ran off into the blackness. Rubbing above their heads and shoulders were fronds of slimy vegetation. The three ran blindly down the stone corridor, hunching themselves to avoid the low-set roof. But in their wake came a fearful rumble. For a moment, Richard thought it might be the cozards behind them. Then a more terrible truth penetrated his mind. It was a rockfall. They were about to be buried alive. The sound grew to an overwhelming crash. 
As the roof caved in on their heads, they were flung to the floor, and for a moment Richard choked on clouds of dust, and then lost consciousness. The rocks crushed Richard's limbs together, and as he came round he could feel their weight pressing against his chest, making breathing almost impossible. A gentle rumble signalled that yet more of the roof was still falling. There was no way out. Richard was trapped for eternity. His quest had come to an inglorious end, buried beneath a mass of rubble deep in the heart of a mountain. But as he struggled out of semi-consciousness, Richard realised that he was not trapped under fallen rocks at all, but he was sitting upright in a dimly lit cave. The pressure on his chest came not from stones, but from thick ropes that bound him tightly to a massive stalagmite. How long had he been unconscious? Out of the corner of his eye, Richard could see Orcan strapped to the same pillar. The rumble he had heard resolved itself into a gravel-throated, strangely accented voice that came from deep within the cave. Richard's senses also picked up something new. A sour smell that was vaguely familiar. He was trying to place it when the voices came nearer. 